Welcome back to Little Bits of Lisp. This time we're going to take a brief look at the evaluation model in Lisp. Now what I mean by that is when we when we have some code and like I said we type something in the REPL and we hit return and we get a result it's that code has been evaluated it's been kind of read in and it has some meaning and it's been executed for whatever that means and we get a result back. What's going on there? Like what is the pattern and how do we read what's going on? So um, Actually, before I start, I'm, I want to point something out. I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be using the phrase object um, in this conversation. Um, when I'm saying object, I'm not meaning it in the strictly object-oriented sense. This is an instance of a class that has been, you know, it's not that. It's any Lisp datum, any any data at all is, uh, is called an object. Um, and this is a kind of more historic uh, definition. I think it was kind of similar. Actually, I think it might have been similar around the similar similar time even. That was difficult to say. Um, but yeah, it's a more classical definition, which makes sense because Lisp is an old language. So that just bears repeating one time before I get into this. But I'm going to try and be a bit loose with terminology. I'm not, well, I'm not trying to be loose with it. I'm trying not to be too hardcore on the terminology I'm, because that's what the spec's for. Um, so what we're really interested in is when we type something and hit return, what do we expect to happen? Now, the first thing is there's a lot of objects that are self-evaluating, like this one. We just typed one and we hit return and we got one back. Nothing special happened. Um, and the same is true for, for strings. If we type string, like with the double quotes and we hit return, we get the string back. Now that kind of makes sense. Um, we don't normally think about this, uh, but it is worth paying attention to. That's also true for keyword symbols. So um, if I say foo, foo evaluates to itself. Um, and, but it's, a, it's, a, it's important to note though that non-keyword symbols, like a regular symbol foo, if I try and evaluate this, what it means is I want you to go and find the value um, that is bound to the variable named foo. That's a very long worded way of saying, what's the value of foo? So if you're in Python and you type kind of A in the REPL and you hit return, you're expecting it to go and tell you what the value of A is. The long-winded way of saying that is, hey, we've got something that is named by the symbol foo. Um, go and get the value that's bound to that. So when I hit return, it's going to freak out and says, ah, the variable foo is unbound. So um, there's nothing to return. But if we define a variable, and again, I'm not going to explain this bit. We're going to have to just accept for a second. If we define foo to be 10, and then I evaluate foo, um, we get 10 back. So see, this has a different rule, right? It's not a self-evaluating object. The, one of the things that's tricky to get used to in Lisp when you start out is that things that you've kind of just treated as the variable itself, these are objects. This is, um, this is a special kind of thing. In fact, we can see that if we use something called the quote. Quote is very special, and you'll see it a lot in Lisp. It means don't evaluate this, right? So it's going to change what happens. And if we don't evaluate foo, we get back something called foo. It's an object. So if I go and check the type of the last thing, this asterisk means the last thing that's been evaluated on the REPL. We'll see it's a symbol. A symbol is an object that is used for naming things. So normally you don't, when, you, when in other languages, maybe you say a equals 10, you don't think about what A is. A is the variable, it's the binding. But A is actually an object in itself in Lisp. And it's a symbol. It's an object used to name things. And symbols have a special evaluation rule. Hey, if you run, if you evaluate foo, it's going to go and look for a value that's bound to that. And lists have a special form as well, right? We must have seen that in, uh, like, that's the thing you would recognize almost immediately from Lisp, is there's just prends everywhere. So our lists have special meaning. One, two, three. What this says, how we evaluate this, is we look at the first thing in the list, and it's going to be a symbol. And so you're going to go and find the function named by this symbol, and then you are going to pass to that function the results of evaluating the rest of the forms in the list. That was a very long way of saying we're going to call plus with some numbers, right? I hit return, you see we get six. Again, a list is not 
a self-evaluating object. These ones just returned, well, not this one, of course, that is a list. One is a self-evaluating object. This string is a self-evaluating object. This keyword, which is a special kind of symbol, special kind, it is a symbol in a special package, uh, evaluated to itself. Foo didn't, and lists don't. They have special evaluation rules. And this is what we're talking about when we, I mean, this, this is one of these things which is kind of like, it feels very obvious, you know? Like, of course, foo is about a variable, but these are the rules, and so we're gonna go through them in an nitty gritty way here, and so we don't have to think about it in other places. Um, so yes, we're calling plus with some numbers. And these, these rules nest. So if I say foo in here, we get 15. So let's do the very long-winded explanation of what happened. To evaluate this list, we first look at the first item, which is going to be a symbol. The symbol names a function, um, the function plus, right? The function that does addition, really. And then we're gonna evaluate the rest of the things and pass them to that function. So how do we evaluate foo? Well, foo is a symbol. So we have to go and find the value that's bound to the, the variable. Yeah, we have, we have to find the number bound to foo, uh, which in this case is 10. And so that becomes, the value of that is 10, and then two and three are self-evaluating. So we're passing 10, two, and three to the function plus. Whew. That's a long way of saying a thing, but that's exactly what it's doing. Um, Cool. What happens if we put quote in front of a list, just like we did with our symbol before? We notice that it doesn't evaluate it, right? This is this thing, this thing that just ran as code, essentially, that was evaluated before. We put this quote in front that says, don't evaluate this next thing, and we get it back as it is. And this isn't a string, right? It's not one of these. Um, we can actually Let's say if I wanted to get the second element of the list. So if I get the second thing, remember the asterisk means the last result from the result of the last thing that was evaluated in the REPL. So this, oh, why am I pointing with my finger? This, so if I do that and we get like foo. So this is, this is data, right? This is a list. Um, when we evaluate it, it's treated as code. When we put the quote in front of it, we say, don't evaluate, we get it as data. That's very important. And it's this easy manipulation of stuff like this is um, one of the like fundamental kind of benefits you get when you're working with Lisp. And it comes out later on. Like it's, there's a lot of things where you get over the initial hurdles of Lisp and then you're kind of coding in a normal way. And then you learn all these extra Lisp, kind of Lisp specific, oh, that was difficult to say, things where all of these kind of design decisions really pay off. Um, there's one other, well, there's, there's a few other things. There's a few other things. What shall I do first though? Well, let's, let's look at another, uh, case. If I do second and try and evaluate that, notice there's no quote in front of it. So I'm going, I'm saying, look up the value that's bound to this variable. The variable second is unbound. There is no value that's tied to this. If I say abort now, I can go back to the REPL. If I do quote second, we know what we're going to get. We're going to get the symbol second. So it's not evaluated. We just get the symbol. If I do this hash quote, this is different. This means go get the function that's named second. Second is a symbol. Symbols are used for naming things. They can be used for naming variables evaluated in this case. This case is go get the function that's bound to it. And so here we get an object, the function second. That was what we, that's what we called here. So when this looks up, it's like when this was evaluated, it was go on, like looks at the first thing. Oh, it's a symbol named second. Go and find the function that is named by the symbol. That's this function here. And then pass it this value. Okay, so that's another Kind of uh, evaluation where we're seeing these different these little symbols prefixed at the front have special meanings um, this is actually a shorthand both of these are shorthand uh, for some special forms so i need to talk to you about special forms really and what's the best way of doing this well let's let's look at one more um, function call 
that we're going to use. So let me clear this for a second. And I'm going to do foo is greater than 10. So again, we not kind of know the rules now. This is going to be the name of a function. We're going to evaluate foo, which I can't remember what foo evaluates to. We'll see in a minute. We're going to then we're going to evaluate 10. 10 evaluates to itself. Both of these values are going to be passed to the greater than function, which is going to return something. And um, it says nil. So if I look at foo, foo is 10. So 10 is not greater than 10, so it's true. What if we did foo is greater than 5? Well, that is true. Cool. So this is our, these are our comparisons. We use nil is the only falsy value. The only thing that is false is nil. Everything else is true. So if we do an if statement, which is going to look like this, if foo is greater than five, uh, we're going to return, what should we return? Yay! And we're going to return foo. Right. Let's evaluate this. So we get back this case, because this returned true. And let's do the converse bit. If it's greater than 20, which it's not, so this returned nil, which means we run this. Now this is a fairly harmless case, but there are some special rules here, right? Because if, the, if if was a regular function, let's just look at this, if this was a regular function, then what's the rules we've already learned? Well, the first thing it would do is it would go and find a function because this, okay, I'll slow down. Let's do the long ass version. This is a list. What are the rules for evaluating a list? We look at the first element of the list. That is going to be a symbol, a symbol that names a function. We go and find the function and we're going to evaluate these other forms in order. Bam, bam, bam. And then we're going to pass those arguments to if and it's going to return a new value. Now, if cannot be a function for very simple reason. Let's change out yay with, you know, start World War Three, and this is have a nap. This would be a problem, right? If it, if it had to evaluate all of these arguments before doing the if, which is the function case, then it will start World War Three and have a nap before it gets to check anything. But we're not saying that. We're saying if this is, is true, then we want to start World War III or do this. So if must have special rules, right? And this is why it's called something, it's, it's known as something called a special form. And there are a bunch of special forms in Common Lisp. And these are ones where the normal rules of evaluation do not apply. Um, if you go to the spec, let's go to the hyperspec here, go into the chapters, and in evaluation, I think it's going to be in here. Let's go find it. Evaluation, evaluation model, form evaluation, cons is as forms, special forms. Here we go. We can see if, if is one of the special forms. Here are a bunch of other special forms. These don't have exactly the same rules of evaluation as you've seen for function calls and symbols and things like this. Um, they are special. I'm also going to leave out of this episode macros because they fundamentally um, follow the original rules, but they do so at a different time. Um, macros are fantastic and they're surprisingly simple when you get into them. Um, but for right now, looking at evaluation, I just want to specify that there are some forms, like if, where we need a different order of evaluation. We don't want to evaluate everything here. We want to evaluate this. And then, depending on what the result of this guy is, evaluate this or this. Okay, so that's the basic rules. Um, of course, this is just a list. So if you put a quote in front of it, it's going to return just as a list, just as data. So we can call the function first on that, and we can get the symbol out of, which is the first element of this list. Okay, so if you've got any questions, throw them in the comments. I know this is quite a lot. It can be confusing just because we're looking at kind of pedantic details. You can get a long way without knowing this, but I think it helps to know it. Um, so thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Ciao.